Uh, Lord, thank you. Uh, Lord, thank you for these men. Thank you for their commitment to you, uh, to this body, uh, and to their families. Lord, I pray that you would help me to equip them, to lead them well, to love them well. Um, Lord, we know that we can't do anything we're going to talk about today or this year without you. Um, And so, Lord, we ask you to indwell us, to fill us with your power, to do the things Uh, that you've called us to do to make your glory known on this earth, beginning with the ends of the earth that lie inside of our own doors. Lord, be honored in our time today, in our conversation. Lord, give us humility. Uh, Lord, give us uh, ears to hear and, uh, Lord, encouraging hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so question, guys. How many of y'all would say that you came from a liturgical church background? Say that you, you went to a liturgical church. Yeah. Lutheran? Methodist, Methodist okay. Uh, Nebraska, I know there's a bit of a melange there. Um, all right. How many of you say you did not come from a, liturg- from a liturgical br- church background? A liturgical church? No? Um, how many of y'all don't know what a liturgical church is? Okay. <laughs> Uh, liturgy, liturgy, and we'll get to it, it, it's a formal pattern of worship. How many of you would say you came from a liturgical background where there was a former pattern? So this would be your, typically speaking, we're thinking you're Catholics and stuff like that, right? Um, how many of y'all were at church this past Sunday? Frank was there, okay. Um, anything feel weird about Sunday? What was weird, Ben? Right? So how many of you were, were viscerally uncomfortable when Frank got up to preach and there was still the worship team behind there? It's like, did he not give them the cue? How long are they going to be there? Uh, it was awkward, right? And then dude starts playing movies and breaking out props, right? It was a weird Sunday. Well, do you know why it was weird? It's because you go to a liturgical church. And you don't think you do. But you do. Think about it. You walk in. You greet Judy. You go into the sanctuary. You chat with your friends. You go to your seat that you go to every week. You talk to the people around you. The worship team starts three minutes too late, but also three minutes before you were ready to shut up. You sing a couple fast songs, a couple slow songs. You all sit down. You know when to sit down. It's when that guy starts praying. You know, all right, we're done. You all sit down. Kids are dismissed after announcements sometimes, or otherwise they all just kind of murmur, and then they leave. And then we preach. And then towards the end, somebody goes and starts playing piano. And you stand up, and we pray. And sometimes there's an altar call. That's a variable, right? We call an audible on that. Every week, right? We are a liturgical church. Churches are, by definition, liturgical, right? Um, you are a liturgical person. Uh, I think that's the biggest, if you're going to view what we're going to do this year at Pops through a lens, I want you to view it through the lens of the fact that you are a liturgical person. So I, I want to start by looking at the definition of liturgy as Justin Early describes it, our author. Um, he says, a liturgy is a pattern of worship we repeat over and over hoping that the pattern draws us into worship and forms us in the image of the one we worship. So I want to start with some assumptions that are baked into that definition. The first one is that we worship, right? That isn't assumed. It's a given. It is not a, if you worship, you do this. Um, You know, when Romans 125 talks about uh, man exchanging the worship of the creator for for that of the created, the assumption is you're going to worship something right? Um, Later in Romans, Paul talks about, um, for from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever. So there's an an implicit, we are built for his glory, to worship him, right? Amen. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is is your true worship or your, your, your acceptable worship. 
So if you think about it this way, if, if a liturgy is a pattern of worship, we as human beings, you will find, are creatures of habit and we are built to be worshipers. Therefore, you are a liturgist. You have a liturgy. You practice a liturgy every day. Um, in his previous book, uh, Justin Whitmell Early, Justin Whitmell Early, I want to cheat on his name sometimes, um, his book, his first book, The Common Rule, which, by the way, I recommend this book, even if you just read the intro, there's a lot of overlap with this. I don't think you need to read both books necessarily, but his intro in that book gives you a little bit more of his backstory of how he came to this place. His website may do it too, so I, I encourage that. Um, but anyway, in his first book, he talks about this habit versus liturgy idea. He says, uh, because our unconscious choices form us just as much, if not more than our conscious ones, we can become formed in patterns we would never consciously choose if we were aware of them. This is the difference between what we call education and formation. Education is what you learn and know, things you are taught. Formation is what you practice and do, things that are caught. The most important things in life, of course, are caught, not taught. And formation is largely about all the unseen habits. This is why to fully understand habits, you must think of habits as liturgies. A liturgy is a pattern of words or actions repeated regularly as a way of worship. The goal of a liturgy is for a participant to be formed in a certain way. For example, I say the Lord's Prayer every night with my sons because I want the words of Jesus' prayer to sink down into their bones. I want that prayer to form the contours of their lives. Notice how similar the definition of liturgy is to the definition of habit. They're both something repeated over and over, which forms you. The only difference is that a liturgy admits it's an act of worship. Um, and you may say, man, I'm completely scattered. Although if you're here on a Saturday morning, you guys probably have some, some patterns in your lives. I don't, I don't imagine that you run roughshod through your life all day, every day, and happen to just coincide with being here on a Saturday morning talking about habits. But even if you have a life that does lack patterns, you have a pattern of disarray. You still have a habit, right? If I don't follow habits and patterns in my life, it's going to be marked by franticness, by forgetfulness, by carelessness, um, specifically related to parenting. If I don't have a habit of quality time with my kids, I'll be viewed as a pattern of being aloof. If I don't have a pattern of intentional, patient discipline with my kids, I'll be viewed as a pattern of being angry, right? Um, everything we do falls into patterns. It is impossible by nature for us as people to be random, to just do random things. All the, like We just don't function that way. We weren't made to do that. So I think the question is, that we should talk about is, is, and we'll talk about it at our tables, inspect what patterns characterize your life. Um, what do you do? <laughs> it's such a simple question, right? I, I was telling, I think, Ben earlier, like coming up with questions to discuss at the end of this was just like, they, the questions kind of write themselves, but it's a real basic question. What do you do? What do you spend your days doing? Uh, the writer Annie Dillard said, uh, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. So what do you spend your life doing? Now, these could be good patterns, right? Um, morning prayer, Bible time, exercise, regular date nights with your wife, um, following up with friends. Uh, you could have lots of patterns that your life exhibits. You could have bad patterns, bad habits. Um, things like... Uh, Sleeping in, snapping at your kids, biting your nails, overeating when you're stressed. Uh, there's lots of bad habits we can find, but we tend to find our way into patterns. Um, and these patterns, when intentionally chosen, are what was termed by some of the early church fathers, the monastics, the Augustines, the Benedicts, as a rule of life. Have, have you all ever heard that term rule of life before you encountered this book? Anybody ever encountered that? 
your wife teaches classical school, so I expect you to understand this. Um, a rule of life, uh, so let's talk about what it's not. So it's not a set of rules you need to follow. Um, because the word rule here, it's come from the Latin regula. Um, and it really, what it, it's more of a word for like a rod or a beam or a trellis for growing plants. Um, and these guys, the Augustans, the Benedicts, they, for their monasteries, they would form this rule of life. And, it, and, and they're interesting to read because um, it, it's, it's simple things like, you know, how much wine to have, like really basic things are like, go be together, um, waking up and praying at certain times. Like all these things are part of the rule of life, but the point of them was to order a life before God and with each other. So a, a trellis, how many of y'all know what a trellis is, right? All right. So a trellis, right? Um, there's fancy ones like all lattice that your my wife might put in the garden. Uh, but this is a vineyard with trellises, right? Um, I, I don't think, by the way, it's a coincidence uh, that we've been talking through discipleship in church on Sunday mornings and this focus on the vine and the vine dresser and being uh, abiding in the vine of Christ. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that that is going on and we're talking about discipleship there and that we're going to talk about this rule of life sort of thing in Pops this year. Because I think the topics go so well hand in hand that I think that God probably planned it. Because he tends to plan things. Um, as we grow in God's grace, we're indwelling. God's, the Holy Spirit is indwelling us. We're walking, we're abiding in Christ. Uh, a trellis serves to support our lives in how we grow in Christ. Can you guys imagine what this would look like if you didn't have these trellises? Uh, without a trellis, that vine is gnarled on the ground. It is getting picked apart by all kinds of critters, right? Um, the trellis gives it a pattern to grow in. It gives it, it gives it shape. You'll see even trellises that are shaped like things and people will grow vines on them and make like statues of things, right? Um, the trellis is there to give it support to grow in. Um, and the fact is, we can know all we want to know about growth. And we're going to hear a lot about growth. And we've been hearing a lot about growth. Um, and we need to know all that stuff. But knowing those things alone doesn't make us grow. Um, and we can have the power of the Holy Spirit. God is the only way we're going to grow. That doesn't mean that we aren't called to put the trellis of in, our, in place in our life to grow onto, to give us some tangible things. Because those vines, if you ever watch like a stop motion video of, of vines growing, it's really crazy. Because they like, they try to get to things. Like plants are crazy, man. And so having those things, having those, those supports to grab onto, for those patterns to grow onto, gives us structure, gives us form that we can grow in in life. Um, I love this quote by, it's a long one, I'm sorry, um, by James K.A. Smith from his book, You Are What You Love. And I, it resonated so much with me. Do you ever experience a gap between what you know and what you do? Have you ever found that new knowledge and information don't seem to translate into a new way of life? Ever had the experience of hearing an incredibly illuminating Sunday, uh, sorry, an incredibly illuminating and informative sermon on a Sunday, waking up Monday morning with new resolve and conviction to be different, and already failing by Tuesday night? Anybody had that happen ever? <laughs> on the way home from church. Um, you're hungry for knowledge. You thirstily drink up biblical ideas. You long to be Christ like. Yet all of that knowledge doesn't seem to translate into a way of life. It seems we can't think our way to holiness. Why is that? Is it because you forgot something? Is there some other piece of knowledge you still need to acquire? Is it because you're not thinking hard enough? What if it's because you aren't just a thinking thing? What if the problem here is precisely the implicit model of the human person we've been working with in this whole approach to discipleship? What if Descartes, you know, Descartes was, uh, I think, therefore I am, right? Um, 
What if Descartes was wrong and we've been hoodwinked into seeing ourselves as thinking things? What if we aren't first and foremost thinkers? Then the problem isn't just our individual resolve or our lack of knowledge. The problem is precisely our thinking thingism, our belief that we're thinking things. But what's the alternative? If we question the primacy of thinking and knowledge, aren't we going to slide into an anti-intellectualist embrace of emotion and feelings? And isn't that precisely what's wrong with contemporary culture? We've embraced an if-it-feels-good-do-it rationale that encourage us to follow our passions and act on whatever whim or instinct or appetite moves us. Isn't that precisely why Christians need to focus on thinking, to acquire the knowledge necessary to counter the culture of impulse? Well, how's that working out for you? Aren't we right back to our problem? Has all of your new knowledge and information and thinking liberated you from those habits? As anyone who has ever attended a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous well knows, your best thinking got you here. To question thinking thingism is not the same as rejecting thinking. To recognize the limits of knowledge is not to embrace ignorance. We don't need less than knowledge, we need more. We need to recognize the power of habit. You probably don't think a lot about habits, and that's the point. Habits are not thought about. Um, but, I, you know, I hear people give illustrations on habits. They talk about driving your car home without thinking about it or tying your shoes. But I went to Louisiana here, and I went with crawfish boils. Uh, you can learn a lot about habit from going to a crawfish boil. Peeling a, a crawfish is a, is a fairly complex set of motor skills. There's precise mechanisms that you're doing here. Um, pull too hard, pull too soft, it doesn't work. You know, you, you can rip the meat off. It's, th there's a lot going on there. And if you ever watch uh, a child, like a, like a little kid or a Yankee, no offense, Mike, peel crawfish, like the, like the, the tongue is out the side of the mouth. They cannot carry on a conversation while they're doing it. Uh, it is... It is taking every bit of them. Uh, you go to your, like, my wife's family out in Lafayette, in New Orleanians. They, like, it's literally, they don't have to look. They just, you're just talking. You're just chatting with your buddies, right? And you, you're just peeling crawfish, and you get a rhythm going, and you're just doing your thing. And it's why you can eat, like, 10 pounds of it, because you just get into a rhythm, and you're not even thinking about it, and you're just popping them in. Uh, you even know <laughs> that when <laughs> your eye itches, how do, you, how do you scratch your eye? The bicep, right? Um, the first time you peeled crawfish as a kid, you did not do that, and you cried, um, right? There, you've learned all of these habits. You've, you've learned when the feel of when you need a new paper towel, right? Habits take time. Like you said, it takes time to develop these habits, to develop the skills, the, the patterns of life. Once you have them, they're there and they're harder to break, and that is the power of habit. Um, I read a book comparing forming habits to investing your energy. So you put it in an investment now. Instead of using your willpower every time you have to do something, you invest it in a pattern, and then it really, it, 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 you reap benefits and compound from that. Um, you think about it. When you're in a really good habit, you're in a groove, right? When you're in a really bad habit, you're in a rut. Either way, you're in something. And that thing takes work to create. If you've, if you've ever dug a ditch, uh, it takes work to dig a ditch. Now, you may have been doing that work, especially if it's a bad habit, unintentionally. You may have been traversing this thing back and forth until you've worn the ground down. But once you're in there, once you're in that ditch, it takes a lot of work to either move the ditch or get out of the ditch. Right? That's where the real effort comes in once you've made the ditch itself. Um, typically speaking, you hear the number about three weeks. It's three weeks what it takes to, to start a pattern or to change a pattern. So if you can get into exercising for three weeks or uh, if you can quit smoking for three weeks, that's typically the number that you hear scientists give. It's, it's an estimate, obviously. But once you do that, once you create that habit, uh, how many of y'all have ever been like exercising regularly and then for a reason or another, maybe you're on vacations or injuries or things like that, you get out of the rut and you miss it. You did not miss it the first day. You know, Mike's talking about running 10Ks later today. 
Um, the first time you ran that, it hurt, right? And you, it took a while, but now you miss not running, right? Uh, you miss running when you don't do it. I think that's, that's the beauty of the habit, though, is that they make good things easier to do and to stay consistent in when they are formed correctly. Now, Nick's talking a lot about habits, and we've like barely touched the Bible. Um, let's talk about Jesus. Was Jesus a man of habit? Um, I think Jesus was a creature of habit, and I think he had a rule of life. Um, we get glimpses of it, and it's funny. I think all, all of these verses are from the same writer, and I love picturing like when you live in the writers, like, oh man, Matthew was really interested in this. Uh, Luke seemed fascinated with Jesus' habits. He talks about them a lot. Um, so, as he came to Nazareth, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue to, on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So there's a habit of gathering together. There's a habit of corporate worship that happens there. Um, he went out and made his way, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. <laughs> I, I, I'm not clear whether he, the plan is for them to follow him, uh, but there is a leadership element here, right? He has this thing that he does, and the, and the disciples, oh, this is the thing that we do, and they follow him. Um, at the same time, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. So there's a habit of regular times of seclusion or isolation for communion with God. So why did Jesus keep the habits that he kept? Oh, I went too far. Um, why did he keep those habits? So we see him putting in a pattern of loving his neighbor, of loving God, right? He's, he is, again, Jesus is fully God and fully man. And as a, as a man, if we're all liturgists, Jesus was a liturgist and the consummate liturgist. So we would do well to inspect what Jesus is doing with his rule of life and emulate it. Um, Christ came primarily as our sacrificial atonement. Um, it is too easy to dismiss him as merely an example to follow. Christ is an exemplary example to follow. The two ideas are not mutually exclusive. So as we go to put on our habits, let's put on those habits of Jesus, right? Let's see. He actively took steps. He didn't just talk about things. He went and did the thing. Um, D.A. Carson, brilliant theologian, writer. Uh, this quote struck me. I wasn't necessarily looking for quotes on parenting and habits. And I, and I just, I love this quote. And this is him talking about his dad. In the ranks of ecclesiastical hierarchies, my father was not a great man. He never served a large church, never wrote a book, never discharged the duties of high denominational office. Doubtless his praying, too, embraced idioms and stylistic idiosyncrasies that should not be copied. I love, by the way, this is like the covering his father's shame here. You know there's like something his dad did when praying that was really embarrassing, that he's just like, you probably shouldn't do that. But with great gratitude to God, I testify that my parents were not hypocrites. That is the worst possible heritage to leave with children. High spiritual pretensions and low performance. My parents were the opposite. Few pretensions and disciplined performance. What they prayed for were the important things. The things that congregate around the prayers of scripture. And sometimes when I look at my own children, I wonder if should the Lord give us another 30 years, they will remember their father as a man of prayer. Or think of him as someone distant who was away from home rather a lot and who wrote a number of obscure books. That quiet reflection often helps me to order my days. Are you ordering your days around things that are meaningful, things that will leave a legacy with those in your four walls? What are your habits built to accomplish? And are they built to accomplish the same things that Jesus built his habits to accomplish? Uh, just in this book talks about the house as a school of love. And as I think about what I want my habits to accomplish, 
uh, I want my home to be a place where kids learn about love. I want them to learn who loves them and why and how to love others. Um, so when I first kicked off Pops, uh, I sent this passage to Pete, specifically the last one. This is kind of my mission statement for Pops, the, the vision verse, if you will, specifically verse 18. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and truth. And the way that's written, by the way, those aren't mutually exclusive. It's not just one. It's both of these things. True love is action, right? We teach our kids in the ordinary day-to-day, -day, right? What we do on a daily basis shows our kids what we love and what they are to love. I wanted this to be like on the, uh, the Pops logo. I'm Pete vetoed it. Um, Y'all all know this passage. This is the command, the statutes and ordinances that the Lord, has, God has, the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you so that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and possess. Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands I am giving you, your son and your grandson, and so that you may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And what command is just like it? Love your neighbor as yourself. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on your doorposts of your house and on your city gates. I love how ordinary all these things are. It's not teach them when you do this big annual pilgrimage to this thing. They had plenty of those too. Plenty of festivals. If you teach them at all the festivals, make sure you talk about these things. Whenever you do Passover, talk about this. Whenever you have the festival of booths, if you've been reading through your Bible plan, you probably have survived if you've made it this far through the Pentateuch. And there's lots of patterns and festivals and orders. God loves patterns. But he's not talking about any of that here. He's just like, hey, when, you, when you're sitting in the house, talk about these things. Uh, when you are walking along the side of the road, talk about these things. Uh, when you lie down and when you get up, that pretty much covers all the things that I do. Talk about these things. They're just normal day-to-day -day things, guys. We're gonna, there are some habits, I think, that we're going to add to lives in, in this semester of study. But I think for the most part, what we're just going to be doing is looking at the patterns that already exist in your life and figuring out how to use them to communicate God's love to your kids and teach them to love others. I think that's really... That's the goal here, is, is not to burden you with 40 new patterns that you need to do. It's to figure out, what am I doing anyway? And how can that be tweaked or redeemed or modified into something that's good and glorious? What daily practice does Jesus call us to? Then he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. By the way, if you go back here, that's how we know love. He laid down his life for us. We emulate him by loving our neighbors, by sacrificing ourselves for our families daily. As I said before, none of these are shortcuts to the fruit of the Spirit, right? The trellis is important, but you need that life flowing through the vine. Okay, guys? So what I'm not going to tell you is if you follow these 10 habits, all your kids will be saved. They're all just going to wake up and be 
glorious little angels the whole time. You're going to have this beautiful, successful life. You're never going to sin. You're never going to be angry. Everything's going to be per- perfect. I can't promise you any of that. <laughs> um, these, the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. It grows on the vine because it's empowered by the Spirit. The trellis gives it a place to grow, but it doesn't give it the power to grow, guys, okay? You need both of these things. So my prayer for you guys on a daily basis as I wake up every morning and pray for this crew is going to be um, that the Holy Spirit would empower you to walk in what God's called you to do. Um, and that we can put the patterns and the habits in place to give it someplace beautiful to grow so that when your kids step back and look, it is like one of those sculptures, and they're like, they can see the love of God in the patterns that you put in place around them. So that's what we're going to do this year, okay? Um, Here's our plan. I'm going to get real practical here. Let's pray first. Let's pray. God, we cannot do this on our own. We cannot do this. Lord, left to ourselves, we can put in habits that we would either fail at or become prideful in succeeding at. Lord, we need you for the power to walk in obedience. God, give us wisdom. Give us insight. Give us humility as we discuss this. Lord, I don't think any of us pretend to know it all. Lord, I pray that you would help us to glean from one another, to learn from one another, to grow in understanding. Lord, to, uh, Lord, to speak in ways that are edifying and ultimately point to you as the source of all good and glory. Lord, not to ourselves or our best practices. Lord, we love you. Lord, we love our kids. We love our families. Help us to do that, uh, Lord, in a way that honors you and that reflects the love that you have for them. Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. So let's talk about our plan for the semester. We are going to meet the first Saturday of every month. Possibly one exception, maybe July. I might push back a week because it's like the weekend of July 4th and it's not a great fit necessarily. We are going to be going through this book. If you don't have this book, get this book. There is an ebook version. Uh, if you want an ebook, if you're that type of guy, you don't like to carry physical books around, I get it. If you're an audiobook person, there's an audiobook. It is on, uh, it is on Audible. It is not on Hoopla. Neither of the books are on Hoopla, sadly. So you actually have to shell out some some cashola for it. Um, like I said, I recommend also if you get your if you're able to get your hands on Habits of the Household, which is is on Hoopla. Look at the first chapter of that if you get a chance. I believe is it not? Oh, not sorry, not Habits of the Household. The Common Rule. Uh, the Common Rule is on Hoopla. Check out the first chapter of that, uh, or the intro, just as an idea of getting a good background on Justin's story. Um, I'll send, there's a podcast episode I heard him on, too. I'll send out that one this week. Um, we will not be doing the chapters in order. So don't be like, I'm going to read ahead and go crazy. Uh, I'll be done. Precrastinate, right? So you do the whole thing before. Um, do not precrastinate. I can tell you that our plan is for this next month, to do the first and 10th chapters of the book. <laughs> um, first and 10th. Uh, it is waking and bedtime. Because uh, I think you can't do one of those well without doing the other one well. Uh, if you don't have a good bedtime routine, your, uh, your morning routine will, will struggle. So I'm going to have somebody teach on those two things together. We're going to do like we've always done. We'll read one or two chapters. Uh, we will listen to a brief teaching, hopefully briefer than I was. And um, then we're going to discuss... Um, then we're going to spend the next month putting on that habit. We're going we're gonna to build this trellis step by step, guys. We're gonna, if I tell you here's 10 things to do right now, that's a recipe for disaster. I say, hey, just practice this. You've got four weeks here, not even three weeks. Build this habit into your life. Um, I'm going to sit you guys at fixed tables. So right now the plan is to have a young dad's table and an old dad's table. However, and this is based on your kid's age, not on your age. Uh, you're like right on the cusp. You have a kid in youth and a kid who's not quite in youth yet. Is that right? I might bump you to the old, old dad's table. For now, I'll sit you here. Um, I know we have a number of guys missing. So then we may have like a middle table, actually. We, we may end up having three tables and have a middle table. Um, uh, for right now, our young dad leaders are Ben Derensborg, Josh Green, and then we have a mentor dad with each table. Dan McConnell uh, couldn't be here today, but he will be working with you guys. 
um, for the guy with like the long-term perspective who's kind of been through the, the fog of war and, and made it. Um, for, the, uh, for the old dads, no offense, uh, Mike Pell is going to be leading, but he's not here today because he's getting ready and moving and stuff. He's got, his month is crazy. Uh, by the way, be looking for an email on that. We may all go help him move at some point. Uh, Gary Becker is going to be helping him out, and Ronnie Sloan is your mentor dad. Um, uh, I'm looking to keep these consistent. Uh, last year, we were just kind of free-flowing sit wherever you want. I think these habits lend themselves better to discussing and checking in with each other and encouraging one another in, in these settings. I want to grow community as well. I'm hoping that we have opportunities as tables to get together outside of here, maybe just, even if it's just once a month, to get together and, you know, watch a ball game or, you know, uh, go for a 10K run. Um, <laughs> a hike. Ben, Commander Ben will take him on a hike, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I'll pass out. I'll pass out 10K for the 10K. Y'all remember 10K? Because um, I want us to grow as a community of dads as well, right? Uh, so that's the plan. Uh, I'm excited to have you guys grab other dads. Be like, hey man, you need to come do this. I would rather have to scramble and find more table leaders and find more mentor dads. Give me that problem all day long. So um, I, I, there's a number of dads I know who registered who aren't here today. They had uh, conflicts. So. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of almost already thinking now. I'm trying to do the, the machinations in my head and figure out who I'm going to rope in next. Um, but anyway, so that's our plan. Any questions about that plan, guys? All right. Let's take just a couple minutes, go potty, and we'll reconvene in five. Uh, I'm a dad, sorry. Uh, do what you got to do. Get another drink, whatever, and we'll reconvene, and we will uh, <laughs> uh, use the facilities, the WC if you're British, and we'll reconvene and have discussion time.